Hello. I guess we're the early ones by 60 seconds. <laughs> oh, I, was, I was actually, I was the first one here and I was like, this is weird. I'm never <laughs> the first one in the meeting in the Zoom. I didn't see anything saying that hey changed. I was almost thinking I was in the wrong link. <laughs> I was second guessing myself. We're in the right place. It's the right place. It's okay. Here in Washington, everybody's gearing up to watch the impeachment hearings. Uh, impeachment how did you like? Did you watch yesterday? Uh, not much, about an hour, and incredibly effective. Jamie Raskin is just. It looked like the best daunting. episode of Perry Mason ever run. Better. Better, better. yeah, better, better, and not in black and white. Very much in color. Yeah. All, all I can think is that we have to somehow organize a million Americans to send personal notes to the congressional, the Senate staffers who work for the Republican members. And we have to basically say, you have to realize that you're going to someday leave the Hill and people are going to ask you, how could you work for that guy? Why didn't you resign when he did this? And I have to think that if, you know, three or four or 15 of the senior staff on these, in these offices went to the boss and said, you've got to explain this to me because if you can't, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm down for that strategy or their kids. Like if you could network their kids to corner them over dinner and say, mom, dad, I don't want this to be on our, like you're, you're basically putting a smear on the family name. Wow. No, seriously, th these people should live in the hall of infamy, the hall of shame, because if they give Trump a pass on this thing, they're busy, they're basically opening Pandora's box for the future. Hey, George. Yeah, I don't know, the kids, the, the, a lot of times conservatives have very liberal kids and liberal adults have Which very is awesome, kids. open door. Well, no, no, they've learned to ignore each other in politics. But, it, but in this case, maybe they can, they can slow down and say, like, this is like family legacy kind of moment, mm. right? Because mm. yeah, you've been ignoring me and it's great that I go out on these protests and I've joined the Black Lives Matter parade and so, it's so easy to ignore me because it's cute because I'm young and I'll, I'll eventually become an arch conservative. But at this moment, you are busy staining our family reputation. Mm. For, for generations, the, the, way yeah. that, the way that they're renaming Confederate statues right now and tearing them down, you're doing that to our family. Hmm. Anyway, that's just a subtle play. Well, how would we get the, uh, if we go with the Senate staffer approach, how would yeah. we get the word out? How would, we, how would we mobilize? And it doesn't have to be people inside the state of yeah. the senator. It just has to be, because in some cases, the staffers aren't from the state. You know, they, they, they're thinking about their next 30 years. A lot of them are locals, right? A lot of them are DC, yeah, yeah. permanent DC people. They're, they're, they're Congress critters who, who become staff and move around across you know, their, their party a lot. So I don't know, there must be like a, is there like a Google group for Senate Republican staffers? Can we get our, can we hack our way onto that? There must be. They hey, must hey, be Jerry. communicating. Jerry, I'm, I missed the opening. Which, who's, which family is being defamed here? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm making the premise that the families of the Republicans who are still backing Trump yep. uh, in the Senate are, yep. are, should basically show up on a hall of shame that lasts a really long time. Yeah. Um, because what they're doing is they're condoning this behavior. And, and yesterday's trial was basically like better than the best Perry Mason episode no. in, yeah. in, its, in its clinical explanation of the escalation of the intentional escalation mm -hmm. of the entire project mm -hmm. and by a mobster by a mobster leader basically you know, might as well be a gambino yeah yeah might as well be a gambino yeah. uh gil you raised your hand or are you is was that yeah, accidental yeah, oh, I, please, I, go I, ahead. yeah so um two things um one is that um uh, I, I, Jane was glued to this all day yesterday. I, I was doing other things and I kept asking her, how is Fox covering this? And she just didn't want to go there. Well, it turns out how Fox is covering this was that when they started to run the footage, Fox cut away to the lawyer who was a kitten. Yep. And they didn't run the footage. And, you know, that's nasty in itself. When you think about that, I don't know, what 30% of American adults got their news from Fox. Right. And probably everybody who was at the Capitol mob got their news from Fox. 
you know, it starts to get a different perspective on what's going on to the matter of shaming the families. Um, that would be one option. The other option would be to reach out to the families and have them shame the member. That's what I'm, that's what, that's I'm what he's that's, proposing. That's, that's that what you're too. proposing. That, so, okay. Mike, good, good. Mike, so it's like, Mike, it's like, you know, Lysistrata redux. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, actually Lysistrata is a, is a sex, uh, sex strike too, which is the third option. Well, that's which Lysistrata, is, right? Uh, yeah, that, I wasn't saying sex strike yet, but that's a really good option too. Um, so anyway, option one, which Mike presented was, how do we contact the staffers of the Republican senators to get them to say, hey, th this is not right. And if, and if a dozen staffers in each office basically rise up and say, we're just against this, that could actually, that could tip a whole bunch of senators and 13 senators have to tip or how many, 17 have to tip is the number, but 10 have already moved. Well, five or six indicated that there are six that they think. Yeah. The, the, numbers are, the numbers are a little uncertain because there's some question over whether it needs to be two thirds of the full Senate or two thirds of the senators present and voting. Present. Right. Uh, and that means that a bunch of Republican senators could decide just to not show up that day. Yeah. Which reduces and, and, the total number and reduces the number of votes needed. But it's, you know, it's somewhere between whatever, you know, seven and 17. Yeah. It's crazy, but riveting, absolutely riveting. And, and a piece of this is like, uh, how do we map this? There's an OGME side to this whole puzzle, uh, which it, there's like five OGME sides to this whole puzzle as I think about it. One of which is, how do you present these arguments in a visual way between, between timelines and uh, networks of, of uh, people involved and uh, compelling ways to make uh, the story even richer and deeper? But another one is, how do you bridge the cultural divide? And we're busy talking about little hacks here. Um, um, how do we, how do you actually get this conversation going? And I've been trying to put my head inside those Republican senators heads uh, and, and try to imagine their mental calculus, right? Partly the bet, partly there's an immediate threat to their, they and their families um, health and well being. They, they, they leave and the same angry people that just put American flags through uh, Capitol Hill police are going to be out at their doorstep and dogging them in airports and wherever else for the rest of their lives. And they know that. I, I mean, I think that's sort of a given. And so apparently the alternatives aren't strong enough to outweigh even that pragmatic consideration. It's weird. And I don't want to eat this call with, with uh, the politics of it, but we are in the middle of an extraordinary trial, simply extraordinary trial. Uh, the evidence is so overwhelming and so clear and all the criminals videoed themselves and, and like, like all this stuff is just simply available. It was funny, Raskin was saying, you know, I used to do trials and in some of my trials, you have to like infer the state of mind of a lot of, and it's like, these people told us. These people were, were, were communicating, navigating this whole thing in public, coordinating in full public view. Klaus, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, the headlines this morning are still that the Republican senators are unconvinced and haven't changed their mind. And that's really uh, leading right back to their voters because the feedback they're getting from their voters is uh, no, nothing has changed. And the voters are impacted by Fox News and the right wing media, which is reinterpreting the information and, and selectively showing these things because no one can sit through for hours and hours of, of watching this. So, most people rely on these snippets that the news networks extract from these conversations. And what Fox News what viewers see is something completely different. And one of the most effective things that's happened so far is Dominion Systems and the other voting companies suing Fox and a whole bunch of other people so that, so that Newsmax had to disclaim and shut down an interview with a dude because they knew they were gonna get their asses sued out of business. That was actually remarkably effective. Uh, Doug then John. Uh, Doug, you're, you're muted. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm feeling like somewhat of an outlier here. Uh, I think of uh, Adam Curtis's films about the reality that we're in, which is created more by uh, the generations of the professional class. And uh, what's so wrong with the country is created by both parties. And that if we end up talking about what's wrong with the Republicans and the Trump followers, 
as though the rest of the world is okay. We're missing how difficult this situation right now actually is. That was so and eloquently that, put. Well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> dealing with the, the problem of the professional class which continues to support its career ladders and its distribution of income uh, is something that we, that this group needs to, I think, struggle with. Uh, I think we've got to, to avoid uh, kind of holier than thou uh, postures in the current situation. And the world is really in trouble. And in a, I think in the long view from history, the whole trial is going to be seen as a distraction from the things we ought really to be being concerned about. Exactly. So, Doug, I just posted a link to a thought I have in my brain. Will, will a Biden administration do enough to fix what's actually broken? And that, that links up to another thought, which was like, there's five, we're in the middle of five global crises, and all of this stuff is distracting us from that. So I, I really completely agree with what you just said. And I would love us not to have to focus on the mobster in chief to be able to get to the conversations that matter, which, which are off the table right now. They're just off the table entirely. So, it is. And, I, and I think your systemic perspective is, is like key for us to get our arms around as well. Uh, John, then Klaus. Yes, so <laughs> it's bad persuasion for me to open by saying this is not the answer. <laughs> So this is not the answer, but it's a, it's bricks, it's pieces of something, just to remind people, if you're going to construct an answer, you might want to use some of these things. I'm on a couple of uh, feeds for teachers of critical thinking and teachers of media literacy. And they're, you know, they're both heartening and disheartening at the same time, for reasons I think you can all guess. I mean, there's a thing, there's a bubble burster. And, but basically, it's it's like the comment about nobody's going to watch the whole thing. So there's a fact checker thing. And they say, OK, here's the, here's the facts here. Oh, no, no, that's not right. You know, this we checked. That's not right. You know, and, and right away, you know, you look at that page and you go, oh, you know, it's like, oh, I already had a bad day. This just made it worse. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I heard about that immediately I said, yep, that would do it. Um, but uh, the caution is it would it would not do it for the hardcore. It would not do it for the senators. OK, it might or might not do it for the staff. But here's the exercise. You say. Here, we got some footage here. We need to edit it. What do you put in? And, you know, you have you, this little workshop. You're going to make you're going to make a program by the end of this thing. You know, and you're going to work in teams. And of course, you know, they're going to be different programs. They're going to be a very slanted program, you know that comes from the team that wants it to be slanted that way. And there's going to be a different slanted program, the team who wants to go that way. And, you know, you can say that the effect is just, well, okay, both sides edit reality. But the experience of sitting on the other side of the screen and watching how the cuts go together and watching the, the change in the emotional effect of having made the cut a certain way is sobering, <laughs> you know. I I did it with the the before he retired editor of sixty minutes in a class, and wow, you know, oh, you know, you just you just realize, wow. I I knew it was important. I knew this was going on, but it was just it's just much more significant than I was willing to give it credit. And I think for people who are not too far locked into one side or the other, the experience of being in a mixed class and doing uh, media synthesis from raw footage would really be enlightening. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Hank. Uh, thanks, John. And the idea that sitting down to collaboratively edit something would would wash into people's brains and make a point is really, really nice. It's uh, because, because then you have to do joint judgment on what do we show? And that forces a lot of these issues and it makes people see stuff. Because I think, I think a lot of the senators, when, when the 12 minute video played yesterday uh, about what, what went down, I think a lot of them didn't know and hadn't seen and hadn't been paying attention or had ignore, you know, intentionally been ignoring. And I love that, that during impeachment, um, everybody's got to stay silent upon pain of prison. Like, like if they pop up and say, no, you lie. If they do that, they go to prison. Like, like, like impeachment rules are different from normal Senate rules. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's very, very interesting. And so they're supposed to be listening to everything without complaining. And some of them have their iPads hidden under their desks, apparently, and, and stuff like that. But it's really, it's a, it's a special moment that way. Um, and how many, before going to Klaus, uh, I think we'd like to keep, start ushering our chats over onto Mattermost, onto the Mattermost chat. Are there several of you who are not on the Mattermost? And can we get you I'm there? Not, I'm not. Um, George, can we, uh, uh, so Hank just put a link to the chat yeah, there. Not. Are you on Mattermost at all? Not at all. Okay, let's get you, let's get you on there. Um, and uh, we'll sort of, we'll do the chat a little bit both ways, but we're trying to move our, all of our chats over onto Mattermost so that they're there permanently and anybody can scroll up and down and it's just much easier. Uh, what's so the, what's, what's the next step that I should take? Just um, we go on mattermost.com. If you go to, um, if you click on the link that Hank just put in this chat, the, 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 the link that says chat collective sense commons.org Agora. If you click on that, it ought to take you to a web browser tab with mattermost present asking you to log in <clears throat> and then say sign up or sign in. And that should give Pete uh, an alert. Oh, good. Pete's on the call now. Um, Pete, we're trying to get George and who else? Klaus, are you not on the Mattermost? I'm on. You're on. Yeah, someone else raised their hand. I thought. Mike Excuse Nelson. Me, I, I don't see. I don't see where in the chat. And Mike Nelson. Let's uh, let me re. re, re uh, actually, Pete, would you? Uh, and and, and yeah. Chat? Perfect. So the, the there we go. Got it. And also Gil and Mike need to get on the Mattermost, and I will go over to Mattermost and and flip my screen around so that I can see stuff. Um, and that being said, let's pass Thank the you. mic to Klaus. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think what, what we what we have to step back from is this is basically political theater that obscures a whole lot of underlying movements. I had an, I listened to an interesting conversation yesterday where a, a Republican operative started to step back from we can't just blame Trump because there are all kinds of other people who have done, uh, uh, who have contributed to this. This wasn't just uh, Donald Trump. In fact, he may he, he he may be the least important actor here. You know, the way they framed it. Um, so Trump's impulse, if he really gets uh, uh, at risk of indicted, would then be to say, "Well, what about Cruz? What about you know, these other senators?" and political operatives because obviously this wasn't just Trump. This was, he was enabled and empowered by an entire group of people. And <clears throat> the, the, the real risk that they, what, what Biden, what this shift you now in political power has already caused is a threat to trillion dollar uh, fortunes. When you think about fossil fuels that are uh, that may be uh, uh, abandoned assets. I mean, when I look at uh, the what's happening in agriculture, I mean, these changes that are being that are being pushed through the system right now have massive impacts for many many people. So we look at this political theater, uh, and and we are using this as as driving decisions without really looking at. The, the, the root, you know, the, the underlying uh, impacts of what happens if Trump gets convicted and Biden gets to run, uh, uh, it gets a more free uh, course of action to implement these massive adjustments to the direction of the economy. And I think that's really where the, the, the pressure points are. The, the complexities of the system are astonishing and the durability of this is astonishing. There's so many aspects of this that are disheartening and crazy making. Um, and we can also switch to a regular uh, check-in round, but I feel like we're in this like extraordinary moment. Uh, any, any other comments on, on this? Uh, I, I'm, so long ago, I read about Milton Erickson, who was a therapist and a hypnotist back during the Great Depression and all that. And briefest story I can try to tell, he had polio twice in his life. Uh, once, when he, once when he was young uh, and his, he was laid up in bed and his family would bring him his bed out into the living room. They, play, they, they were apparently like a pretty high functioning family, really nice. Um, and um, 
he learned to read uh, skin tone, like when somebody's ears were red and he, he learned to listen to, to, tone, to pitch of voice and all that. He got extremely sensitive to sort of how humans represented stuff. And then he, he learned sort of hypnotism as a hobby as a hobby. And then later, as he grew up, he had polio again, and he used hypnotism as a pain management for himself. Um, but he was famous for his handshake inductions. And basically, he could shake hands with, with a patient. And by the time they had finished shaking hands, because when you, sh shaking hands is such a deeply rooted autonomous sort of gesture, <clears throat> that you go into kind of a little loop, and your, your body and mind go into a loop, by the time he would let go of your hand, you'd be in trance. Anyway, mm -hmm. all of that to say, that he was known for basically making small suggestions to your subconscious that would change behavior. He was trying to increase your subconscious's behavioral repertory so that when you entered a situation where you previously only had like one trigger response, like you're approaching a bridge, I, I hate bridges, I'm gonna panic and I'm just gonna panic. You could then pull over and take some breaths. You could do whatever else. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what, it, what would Milton Erickson have done to the collective psyche now? Because I've watched some things over time happen pretty quickly. I watched as instant messaging spent $0 on marketing, $0. And suddenly everybody was like, hey, I am me that. And yeah, buddy, he was this. And, and it was like a contagious tool that was really useful, that didn't have a business model. Uh, and, and it just took over the world and, and caused large scale behavioral change. I watched that happen. Uh, and that's different from political points of view and all that. And I've been tracking and watching the, the, the growth of the far right and all that. Um, so uh, so I'll, I'll say that and I'll, I'll hand off to George in a second. Gil, your hand is still up and I think your hand is up because earlier you, you wanted to jump in. So if you can lower your hand while you're busy troubleshooting Mattermost, that would be awesome. Uh, and now I'll pass the mic to George. My favorite Erickson story that might be relevant here is a young man was uh, waited a long, long time to see him. Prison, yeah. and waited in his waiting room for waited months to see him. Waited in his waiting room for a long, long, long time. Came in, sat down. Erickson looked at him and said, "You know what to do. Get the hell out of here." <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was kind of, amazing. Kind of appalling and profound at the same time. Exactly. But, and and Erickson funny. had this Wu Wei approach to psychotherapy. Wu Wei is action through least action. Um, and, and, and so I'm always trying to figure out what is the, what is the smallest thing you can do to, to sort of change the system in some large way. Um, Kevin, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, uh, I'm firmly convinced that behavior change is not viral, uh, that it's a complex contagion <clears throat> that you and you know, if you look at the QAnon stuff, they got it from their friends and neighbors, multiple sources, multiple times. And to believe that behavior change is viral is incorrect. Information that? exchange is, is viral. Uh, to really go to uh, behavior change, it's a complex contagion. And Damon Centola has written really well about that in his book, Change. And, and, and documented that behavior change is not a viral phenomenon. Can you elaborate on why that, I think when we say viral, we mean it really loosely, but I think we mean complex behavioral change that, that cascades in no, many ways. It, it no, doesn't, it doesn't mean that actually. Viral means it looks like fireworks. It spreads rapidly from single touches. Complex contagions look in topology like you're in a fishnet and there's multiple connections within your group. You need multiple connections from people you trust to get to behavior change. I've got a whole bunch of stuff on QAnon and how it's a complex contagion. And Kevin, can you throw those things in the chat? In the Mattermost? Uh, yeah. yeah, let me, okay, I was just... Uh, Share it, but as you, you don't even have to do it right away, but just um, if yeah, you throw that stuff, yeah. that'd be great. <clears throat> yeah, I, and I have a bunch of links in a blog post I haven't written that I'll just start putting there. But, but, but the topology of viral and behavior change is not the same. You can, you can, you can get uh, COVID virally and you can get AIDS virally. You can't do behavior change without multiple trusted references around you. And, and, and I, I'll put them up there. During so the the, so we, the difference between viral, the difference between viral growth, which is small compounding and a critical mass explosion. I explain this all in my book on word of mouth marketing. But there, you get a critical mass and you get a gigantic explosion versus just 1% growth, which can be over the world gigantic after a while. 
So we're using viral. we're using viral because we're being lazy apparently about the actual dynamics of this movement. But is there a shorthand word we can use for the more complex kind of change? Because I know that Centola is also complex talking, contagion talking, about, is, talking about tipping points. Yeah, I mean, and you can get to you know ten percent can be a tipping point that kind right. of thing. But complex contagions are explicitly different than viral contagions. I mean, okay. they are diseases that that spread differently. Behavior change spreads differently. The misconception was popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in, yeah. in, in uh, uh, yeah. but he got it all wrong. He did. He gets a lot of things wrong, George. <clears throat> there is that yes, problem. Yes, he makes it. He makes up a lot of a lot of, you know. If you if if you look at some of the interviews that I'll post of people who got into QAnon, it's like I thought it was crazy, and then my sister in law did it, and then my brother in law did it, and then somebody else did it, and suddenly you have multiple voices from multiple places that are saying that's the way to go. And, and part that, of that's a different form of contagion. And a part of the reason why there's a large chunk of the of the American population that believes that the election was stolen and completely believes that is that everybody around them, everyone in their social circles, everyone they saw, everyone on the news they were watching was completely on board. And there's no way there could be that many Americans left out, left over to actually outnumber us. Like they, like it was overwhelming. Their entire circles were in. Doug? Yeah, uh, the first thing is that contagions uh, only spread when the ground that they're happening <laughs> on has been long prepared. So it's not the contagion mm. emerges into history by itself. Mm. Uh, there's a, turning the world into an agar agar solution where the contagion can grow, I think is really important to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Um, they were out in the gold, got the flu. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I just posted um, a, uh, uh, an example here of what is happening at community level where mm -hmm. Uh, the idea to engage restaurants which are sitting idle and employees which are, who are unemployed are now producing food for, un for uh, uh, needed people instead of uh, handing someone a box of groceries, they can go and get a completed meal or ready to go meal. Those are impactful things. And when we are talking about contagion of ideas, they have to have a practical benefit. I mean, the conspiracy gets you only so on so far. It doesn't have any personal impact on your life. But the moment people see something that changes, that impacts their well-being, that idea uh, 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 resonates, and that idea is being picked up. Huh? So the so um, the, Gil, the can idea you that can you mute your phone, Gil? So the, 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 the start here is to particularly to go into the most disenfranchised communities with real life programs that assist them will shift the attention uh, of, of people towards more practical things, towards self-help things and take them out of this uh, political uh, 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 agitation that they, are, that they are being used for basically. Um, thanks, Gil. I thought I heard sound from your mic and it didn't look like you were muted when that sound happened. So I apologize if you already were muted. Um, cool. And um, Pete, I'm sorry to distract you by helping people get into the matter most while we're having this conversation. I, I apologize. It's just, uh, so why don't we do a check-in round? Let's go back to our normal habits on Thursdays. And I'll start with, uh, with uh, Tony, Matt, and Kevin. Uh, yeah. Hi, Tony. Um, Marcados here. Uh, I have nothing to say. I'm just listening today. Happy to have you here. How about that? Thanks for being here. Uh, Matt, Kevin, Hank. Hey, everybody. Um, I, maybe just to start, I've been, I, I've been talking to a bunch of people asking them if they watch the trials. Um, and, um, so far I've gotten, um, I'm like, oh, for 12. Um, wow. Yeah. And these are smart people. These are engaged people. And these are my family members. So I think, I think we can make the assumption that everybody's watching this stuff and processing it. I would, I would probably wager that the majority of Americans are avoiding it. Um, Right, and George, is that right? Is that I'm not. I'm not watching it. I'm. I wrote two chapters in my book instead. Okay, and I think um, you know, I think that that's a really an interesting 
it's just an interesting thing because there's one there's one thing to listen to the news cycles afterwards report on it there's another thing actually to to listen to the case itself and to sort of put it together for yourself and i think that those things are drastically different and this you know um you know the intermediation of information through you know you know through those cycles or not even people just stepping away i think is really interesting so that's just a first observation the second thing is um i um introduced a, a quest into um into the discourse the other day about um putting together a little you know putting together a little package around the work that's being done by um um, it's not the tools for connectors. It's the emerging, it's the emerging um, events um, guild, um, and we're playing around with this idea of how do you sense what's going on in the world and make sense of that, and then put together and put together sort of really good packages. And I think the um, I think the impeachment is a really interesting way that they actually are using language. Yes, it's evocative. But they're not they're not going over into because like if I were a speech writer and or I've written speeches, if you were asking someone to write that speech, you'd probably ask them to talk about it in a very different way, right? To repeat certain words to and they are really holding back on anything but just laying it out piece by piece. And I'm really impressed by that level of restraint and the level of pulling back kind of the rhetoric. Um, you know, um, and so I think that that kind of that kind of um, presentation is actually highly effective when doing um, when um, illuminating um, sense making, right? Because sense they made sense of a situation by aggregating a bunch of information, and now they're presenting that in a way that other people can follow along with how they made sense of it. And I thought they did a good job. And that's something what I want to think about with this with this quest. So, um, and the reason why I bring up the quest is I think that we're starting to closer with OGM about what is this group, right? We're members of a community, um, which is different than OGM, the um, the infrastructure, the the um, the the soil, the fertile ground, if you will, Doug, of and the fertile, you know, the fertile um, estuary of the ecology that be will become of a kind of a web of people, a web of work and a web of knowledge, right? Which I think is what we're building. So I wanted to put that out there because I don't think we've talked a lot about OGM. We kind of have these, these Thursday calls are conversations where we're participants in the community, um, which I think is wonderful. And just recognizing what these meetings are is I think is important, which leads me to my last um, question. if. I have a quest. Um, it's related to this project that I'm working on, which is called um, uh, Cunatomy. Um, and Cunatomy, um, its its general principle was how do we understand um, what's going on broadly through um, asking of simple questions. Um, over time, long periods of time. So it's sort of think about it as, as a longitudinal survey, but instead of like, um, and it started actually, and it's coming up on Valentine's Day. I wonder, just to illuminate what Cunatomy is, I wonder what would happen if we asked everybody in the world, what does love mean to them, right? So what does love mean to you? And we do it on Valentine's Day. And then we do it again next Valentine's Day. And then we do it again, the Valentine's Day after that. What would happen had, if we had been doing that since the 19, you know, let's say just my life, you know, um, you know, since the early 70s, um, you know, Doug, I'd love, I'd love to hear over your life, how has this understanding of love changed? And then how would you compare maybe one generation to another generation? How would you compare, um, how could you analyze um, white men from Boston versus white women from Boston or white men from Boston with white men from California or 40 year olds versus 50 year olds now. And so I think that this, this idea of one question at a time, text out to the world where people can answer in a very short format. And that's why I wanted it to be text that we're running analytics on. What would that tell us about us? Um, 
And so I would love if we could spin up, and it's probably too short, just a simple web page with the question of what does love mean to you, where we have a simple database on the back end and we collect a little bit of demographic stuff and we just get it out to everybody that we, you know, we just get it out. Um, I get my daughters to put it out on the social media that I'm not a part of and so forth. Um, I just think we would start to like almost have a, see the anatomy of the way that our minds as both individuals and a society are operating, um, you know, operating on a, on, a, on a long basis. So it's sort of like the largest longitudinal study through good questions every day, text to you and you can answer them or not. And then you can look at yourself and compare yourself to others and we can aggregate it. And the reason why I never acted on it um, and never asked for anyone to do it is um, I didn't want it to put it in the hands of a corporation that would use it to market. Um, and so that's why I think this group is the right group to, to bring, this, bring this to, and it may be something we put on the back burner, but it's, that's what's on my mind today. Um, Matt, thank you. And it's ringing a very faint bell for me that somebody somewhere had done a slow drip polling experiment that was not, not as interesting as, as what you've just described, but there's, there's a bit of history in this that I'll try to find uh, as we go. But I think it's a great idea and a really yeah, nice Yeah, and there was the, like the post secrets project was kind of interesting. Yeah. You know, um, I had done a secrets project when I was um, before the internet in, when I was in college. So I think that they're, you know, Datum does some interesting things here, which is collecting sort of data. And it's not just, you know, regular data, but it's like data about, you know, every day that you bring an umbrella or every, you know, something like that, right? Um, and so I think there are other ways of these kind of collections. I just, I'm looking for that elegant thing, which is really about how we, about what we believe and how we think. Mm -hmm. um, so. Okay. Uh, let me go to Mike next because Mike has to bounce off this call soon. So we'll um, we'll just twist the queue a little bit. Yeah, I really apologize, but if I could take two or three minutes, that would be helpful. Um, I work at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I've had two jobs. One is as a research fellow, and one is coordinating our technology and international affairs program. And we're looking to hire somebody to kind of split the job. So I'm and this is not a public announcement yet. We haven't put a job description out, but I'd be curious if anybody knows anybody who is adept at managing um, research projects around tech policy, particularly within an international bent. Um, my email, I'll put my email in the, uh, um, in the um, mind matter, matter. Mattermost. <laughs> yeah, matter most. Mind over matter. The other more interesting question is that we're also replacing the head of the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, Bill Burns, as you may have seen, is now the head of the CIA. And I, I, I don't expect people on this call know people personally who would fit in that job, but I'm curious if people know of high level diplomats, you know, legendary people who are. Um, well, actually not legendary yet. We're, we're looking for mm -hmm. somebody who's you know, been in the business long enough to know everybody that matters and know how to make decisions about what the big issues are and where Carnegie should be going. But I'd, I'd just be, it's sort of, sort of a personal, a, per, a popularity contest. You know, as you look around at high profile diplomats, who would you consider or who would you think that we should look at? I'm also, I'm torn by this, this polarity of who knows everybody and sort of who would be welcomed in with who actually seems to have hacked how some of these things might be working and could change how diplomacy and politics and power politics are happening. Like who, who could get, who could crack the code on that? And That'd why diplomat? I mean, Mike, I don't know, understand enough about what you imagine the job is, but I, I'm, my mind is racing in a good way. Well, it doesn't have to be a diplomat. It has to be somebody who understands diplomacy. And because that's what that's what the person, what you guys are working on is is diplomacy. It is working on policy that has an international yeah. aspect. So it's the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and we're trying to understand how the world is changing. My team is looking at how technology is changing the world and changing governments and changing geopolitics. But a lot of our people are looking at developments in Russia. We had a talk this morning about 
the protests in Russia. Um, so that's that. A lot of our team is regional studies, tracking what's going on in places around the world. But we have these cross-cutting groups that look at nuclear policy, space policy. Um, in my case, impacts of tech. So there's a lot of different. Uh, are, are there any proponents at the endowment for uh, there to be a U.S. Secretary of Peace? It's been a proposed. A Department of Peace. We have a Department of War, which is now called the Department of Defense, because of course we never go aggressively attack anybody. Um, but why why wouldn't we have a Department of Peace and then have Carnegie like feed that? That'd be awesome. Like our government should actually have United that. States Institute of Peace. Yeah, but cabinet level. Like, like let's actually stop right. tromping on other countries because we have a nice long history of it. There's a book titled Overthrow, which is about, and it was published in the 60s or 70s, about the 64 times the U.S. has overthrown other, other countries' leaders, mm -hmm. uh, starting with Queen Kamehameha in Hawaii and going through the Shah and a bunch of others. Uh, I mean, the Shah we put in, we, uh, Mossadegh, we, we toppled so that we could put the Shah in place. There's like this insane, terrible story of America uh, basically trampling around the world and, and doing this kind of stuff. So if we, if, we, if we explicitly took an opposite approach and cop to the shit we pulled over history, that would, that would flip a lot of things. That person would be pretty credible, at least worldwide, probably not in the US. Uh, Doug, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, Mike, uh, when you hire somebody for that job, they should have a backup group that's talking about serious questions of strategy off the record. Well, a lot of what we do is off the record, which is probably why some of you haven't heard about Carnegie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it is quiet, high level, Chatham House rule kind of meetings. I would interview Malka Older. I think she's really interesting. Uh, she worked in Darfur and a lot of other uh, failed state situations. Mm -hmm. Then she's become a near-term sci-fi writer, but she writes op-eds for the New York Times and the Post and uh, is leading some other kinds of policy speculative kinds of things. I think you would learn something from talking to her. I'm a, I'm a real follower of um, everything she does. Well, that might help on the other thing I do, which is I'm on the board of the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation which perpetuates mm. his memory and you know, awards an annual award to people who are uh, combining imagination which, with futuring. So we're trying to stimulate future thinking. How do you spell her name? M-A-L-K-A-O-L-D-E-R. Okay. Um, another, another thought is Molly Melching, and I have no idea whether she's personable and knows the world, but she's the woman who um, by hacking the Quran has reduced female genital mutilation across Africa in a pretty significant way. Um, and she basically went to imams and villages and said, hey, guess what? Um, FGM is not in the Quran. There's no real reason to be doing it. Mm. And they agreed. And then once the imam said, hey, we don't do this anymore, it cascaded down and really worked. And then somebody who understands how to do culturally appropriate social dynamics like that would be a really great voice. Hmm. Interesting. I knew I'd get some interesting ideas of people to talk to and ways to think about this position. Cool. And Peter, thank you for putting up the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation link. And uh, I'm adding a link to the Melching story to our chat as well. Okay. Cool. Um, so let's go, and I've forgotten what the queue was. Uh, let me re. Uh, Oop. Let me re reinstate the queue a little bit. Uh, we had Matt. So Hank, Pete, Scott. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> quick update for me that that has some connections to some of the conversations that we've been uh, that we've had already today. Um, I so I did a little personal experiment. Uh, so I spent two weeks where I found a podcast or I don't know if it's really an official podcast, but whatever. It was like every night I listened to this guy that like no joke, probably half a million people, according to his rumble, listen to every single night. Huge Q conspirator because I was like, I got to listen. Right. And like actually hear what these cats are talking about. Um, and it was interesting because even though I 
am generally like pretty resistant <clears throat> to a lot of those ideas. Um, for the first couple of days, I was like, holy shit, this dude might be onto something. You know what I mean? And then the more I kept on listening, the more I was just like, all right, this, this story is changing. It's like every day, it's kind of like taking what's happening and fitting it into, you know, the mental model that he has, which we've talked about a lot, right? About how people just take information and fit it into the way they understand the world versus pausing and thinking. So um, it was an interesting thought experiment for me. Um, I can't say that. I mean, I'm definitely not a convert, but it, <laughs> uh, but it was, it was just, it was just interesting. And it got me thinking a lot about the human tendency to amplify negative information um, and how that might play a role in just some of the dynamics that we've been talking about, you know, not, not to paint with too broad of a stroke, but um, you know, it just kind of, it's, it's, it sparked a lot of thoughts uh, in regards to what's happening politically, what happens um, culturally in corporations um, and uh, what happens in our personal lives too, right? Like where something, all kinds of good things can be happening, but if we, you know, don't necessarily understand the, uh, you know, ambiguous pieces of information. And we see, you know, it's easy for us to see them as a threat to the way that we live our lives now and um, turn that into some, you know, that told negativity bias idea. So um, that's, that's kind of where I'm at and what I've been thinking about for the past week or so. Um, so, yeah. That's just awesome. Thank you. Like really a cool, really a cool experiment. And um... well, it was scary, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I, and and it sounds like in several ways, right? Um, yeah. Um, awesome. Anybody else sort of gone and listened to to the DQ side? See, you, you're unique in the in the crowd. Yeah, sort of. I, I mean, you know, and just to just to sorry to put one final kind of point on it. The, I think the craziest thing for me, or the the big realization for me, was like. I had to acknowledge that there was some resonance, you know, where I was kind of like, oh, I see that happening too. The issue that I have is that like, I think that you are completely misdiagnosing either the problem or the solution, right? Just so that you can perpetuate your point of view. Um, and so that, that kind of connects to what I was saying last week about like having real, real conversations about things that are actually going on and, and how we want to fix them. Um, where I was like, I don't, even though I think that this guy might have a an interesting idea. Um, I don't know that I could sit and talk to him because I feel like if I said this, the conversation would shut, would like completely degrade. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, well, it'd be sick if he was an OGM and we could just have a big conversation about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let me go into my, on the room. other hand, if you, if, on the other hand, if you actually talk with him, he might have a different conversation than he normally has most days. Yeah. So true. So yeah. true. And I can and I can understand where some of these hooks come from. For example, I have a belief that uh, child abuse is much more epidemic than we're willing to face and that we report and so forth, um, including systemic kinds of child abuse that we don't even notice, uh, like, uh, you know, put the baby in the other room and make sure they cry themselves to sleep kind of thing. I think that's a, you know, I, I believe in like baby in crib and kind of a baby on in bed and, and co-sleeping and all that, which is sort of weirdly taboo. But but I don't believe that the Democrats are meeting in the basement of the pizza parlor to drink the blood of children kind of thing, begin, you know, performing satanic rituals. That's like, mm, not so much. But, but I can see that if someone were digging and turning the soil on, on child abuse and its systemic uh, sort of uh, role, I'd be like, yes. Like, I, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. So, so, you know, and then misdiagnosing and then building other kinds of stories around it uh, goes crazy really, but it's, it's crazy how crazy it goes, how quickly. And then if you layer on top of that, the articles that uh, that Adrian Hahn and others have been writing about is QAnon and ARG, or you know, were the were the protesters LARPing into the the Capitol and all that, uh, where LARP is live action role play, uh, super interesting stuff. Um, so let's go, uh, Pete Scott Gill. Good morning, all. It's it's uh, good to see y'all. Um, I think we've pretty much got most people into the Mattermost now, which is really cool. That's great. Um, uh, I wanted to, I, I wanted to say that uh, the Thursday calls are great, and some of us just come for the Thursday calls to OGM, and and there are others of us who have kind of a, 
a broader interaction with or more projects with OGM OGM folks. Um, one of those is something we we call the, the steering team. Uh, there's a Tuesday call, uh, which is actually not closed or anything. Um, it's open to whoever. Uh, there's a, a separate channel for it. Uh, it's got sense making in the name of it. Uh, if you go over to public channels and, and click more, you'll see all the channels you could join on Mattermost. Um, uh, I wanted to say this this week's we had a, a really um, productive uh, discussion and um, and uh, you can get a, a glimpse of it kind of uh, I'm going to post a, a doc which covered some of actually only a tiny bit of the discussion and then some of the other things that are going on in OGM. Uh, this is a doc that I, I set up to kind of talk about the different kinds of activities going on in OGM, at least some of them. Um, so long story short, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot to OGM uh, and there are some of us working on ways to kind of uh, create an umbrella organization, kind of like an OGM foundation or something like that, that is a little bit more a little bit more firmed up and also um, able to kind of help direct uh, lots of different kinds of stuff in OGM. Um, I think that's it for me. Awesome. And I think the channel is called uh, Steering Tuesday, uh, OGM Steering Tuesday, right? Uh, OGM Steering Tuesday hash jam sesh. Hashtag jam sesh. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's uh, Hank's name for it. If you just go over to more and, and, mm. and then click on that and look and for find it. it. And uh, that call is on Tuesdays an hour earlier at our old 7 a.m. time. So that call has not moved to, to 8 a.m. So if anybody wants to join, you are totally welcome. And we're, we're sort of trying to put multiple, many hands on the rudder to figure out what shape we take. So thanks for mentioning that, Pete. Uh, let's go Scott, Gill, uh, Doug. Hey, everyone. Um, three things today. So Hank, you, sp you spurred something for me that I didn't realize I was doing but it's kind of interesting. All of my Zoom calls are left-leaning. All of my YouTube consumption is right-leaning. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's an interesting balance. Um, so I'm not engaging in the conversations on the right, but I'm listening to that, that perspective and that content. And so I'm finding that a really interesting balance. Um, and I didn't realize that I was doing it. I guess I didn't consciously set that up. So anyway, that's, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, Can you restate that change, thing. Scott? Can you restate that change? Yes. So all of my Zoom group conversations tend to be with left-leaning groups. So their conversations, their interactions in the whole group tends, tends that way. All of my YouTube podcasts and content that I take in that way, which is not a conversation, is right-leaning. And so I'm, I'm getting that balance. I'm not, I'm not interacting, but I'm getting that the same uh, input levels, I guess. And it's, it's clearly split. I, you know, it's, it's funny, I just didn't notice that until I was reflecting on what Hank had said. Super interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Um, second thing is, I in one of those little little meetings on the, on the YouTube side, it was it was interesting. The comment was, instead of two fists hitting each other, what about a flint striking a rock, making a spark that could provide you know, the, the fire as not, not as burning everything down, but a fire as a valuable source of, of what we need. And, you know, it even, it even kind of felt like, like the, the rock was a little red and the, the flint was a little blue. You know, it just kind of worked for me on, on a lot of levels. But I thought, you know, that, that's interesting is that the flint and the, and the stone by themselves are not as effective as they are if they're together making something from the friction of contact. Um, so it was, just a, it was just a little throwaway comment in the middle of the piece. And I thought, wow, that's really good. I like that. Um, so then the last thing is, for what it's worth, um, my thinking skills program has blossomed, I guess. 
it started off as a little small thing and now it's gotten to the point where it's it goes from thinking thoughts saving placeholders making things playing games telling stories living flow and being you it, it's it's this framework and it's it's very individually set up um which kind of makes sense because that's kind of how i work it certainly plays well with others but the last thing that I got to was this weird understanding that a symphony is the best representation of what I think a life is. There's multiple levels occurring over time, rising, falling, it has movements, it has, you know, all that sort of thing. And that you can't take one part out of it and have, this, have it be what it is. And so I, I kind of got to this idea, it's kind of a working title, Sympho Me. So it's basically symphony, except with a me at the end. Um, you know, it's a harmonious way to think, create, play, and compose the unique symphony of your life. And that's what these tools are. And I don't know, I haven't said that to anyone yet, so I thought I'd say it here. That's it for me. Put those stages in the chat. Sure thing. And George, we're trying to chat over on the Mattermost. So uh, Scott, if you can put those in the Mattermost chat, that'd be great. Okay, I'll, I'll get over there by next time. Awesome. I just um, don't wanna get distracted. Yeah, exactly, cool. Uh, good, then we had uh, Gil, Doug, Judy. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Hi, everybody. Um, um, Jerry, thank you for the new addiction in my life. Uh, just, you know, I have not been regular on OGM, but here I am now. Um, Sweet. I, I wonder, um, there, there's so much good stuff going on, just even in this community, the acronyms that you all have been rattling off over the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, I need some help figuring out how to navigate all the action and still have a life. So if anybody would care to chat with me about that offline, I'd love to hear that. I, I've just added a, added a note in my Evernote of, you know, websites to keep to scan and keep track of on a regular basis, not newsy things, but things like this that I need to be present to and interactive with. Um, um, I'm, I'm perplexed why this conversation is mostly all guys conversation yeah. for another time. Uh, I find, and I'm asking that not just out of a, you know, uh, inclusion balance story, but um, I find that uh, the richness of conversations is very, very different uh, when they're diverse in many different dimensions. And uh, we're, you know, we're predominantly male, white, geeky here. So there's that. A um, um, cu couple of things. Um, reflecting on what Doug said back at the beginning of the call, um, and um, and um, I'm sorry, I just lost the thread of who was just speaking before me, Scott. Um, um, uh, Fernando Flores offered an interesting provocation the other day in a meeting we were in. He said, you know, what if we had, what if we had conversations and meetings in which we didn't share opinions and we didn't problem solve? What might open up? And that's another version of the, of the, of, of, of the flint and the stone. Um, you know, we need different kinds of conversations that, 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 that spark something using that metaphor, that generates something new. Um, I, I, over the last year or two, I've, uh, I, I, in my bubble, I don't encounter much on the right. I don't have the stomach to watch a lot of the YouTubes. I periodically say to Jane, let's go watch Fox News for a while and I can handle it for about three minutes. So I'm, you know, I'm part of that problem. Um, but over the past couple of years, I've become very dear friends with a fellow on the right supply side economist, Trump voter. Um, we love each other. We have really interesting conversations together. Uh, I thought that I would show him the light on all sorts of things, which maybe I have, uh, uh, but for it to be an actual friendship, I need to be open to him changing me also. And that's happened some, and it's rich and delicious. And, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a model of something. I don't know how that scales. I know there are people working on that, but I think that that conversation is, is deeply important. Uh, at the same time, and I think I posted this, thank you, Pete, for helping me get into the chat. I posted it there that, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I appreciated Doug's challenge of not jumping to conclusions too quickly, but here we are in, in, you know, in a multi-causality world that's also polycentric. 
uh, we, we don't have the same kind of shared experience at the national scale that we did when I was a kid. And everybody's inhabiting different realities on that stuff. And we have occasional actual criminal activity, which I think is what's on the table right now. So it makes it a very difficult uh, conversation. Um, personal dimension, I am um, I'm, I'm orbiting or dancing a lot between deep reflection and commitment to action on the things that I, that I care about. Uh, and it's a challenging balance, uh, both in terms of time and also personal center. Uh, in terms of the action stuff, I got my second jab yesterday. That's good. Uh, consulting business is cranking up after a year of almost nothing. We had a major client uh, last February, February in the last March, I guess, who said, we really want to do this. Uh, we're swamped with keeping our supply chain alive. Go away. Come back. You know, we'll come back later. And I came back month after month. And finally, I said, just like, go away. We'll get back to you. That was May. Uh, supply chain manager saying this is the hardest supply chain situation I've ever dealt with in my life. Chief, not managers, chief supply chain officer. Uh, well, a couple of days ago, they called back, said, okay, we're ready to go. And so we revise and propose a meeting with them next week. That's very cool. Uh, and the money flow will be nice. And, um, and it challenges me to how to put sufficient attention to the new escapades that I'm trying to design. So it's, it's a good, it's, it's good resourcing of my prior life and there's a new life waiting to get born here and um, finding finding a way to give it sufficient attention um, is, is, is a, is a pre very present challenge for me um, and all of it deeply enriched by the deep reflection of conversations like these and other groups that have been like this that are you know it, 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 it's part it's, it's I guess it's the story of slowing down to go fast as the, Navy, as the Navy SEALs say, um, uh, fast is slow, fast is slow, slow is smooth, smooth is, wait, smooth is fast. How's it go? Damn it. Some, anybody in the Navy here? Yeah. Um, I know where you're going, but I'll, 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 I'll find it. It's in my brain. It's in my brain, of course. Scott, did you understand this? Uh, yeah, it was a quick comment about Gil saying how, I don't know how this scales. So. The thought that comes to mind is that I know a thousand people, you know a thousand people. Yeah. We're one step away from a million, two steps yeah. away from a billion, and yeah. that's how it scales. Thank you. Thank you. It's good because it 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 really needs the the full embodied personal dimension. And so that's a good answer. Thank you. And the quote was slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Thank you, Pete. And um, a, a tiny story, a friend of mine a long time ago when paintball was, was big, and I, I, I haven't really done any paintball battles, but he was saying like, it's weird in that he learned that when he was a rookie paintball player, he was just like all panicked, like he was gonna get shot. And he says, all you really need to do is like calm down. You, you can just walk up and shoot people because they're busy going like, ah, mm -hmm. my gun's jammed, mm -hmm. don't know what to do. And, and mm -hmm. so just, just being slow and being mindful actually really yeah. works because you get you get whatever you need to do kind of done. Yep. Um, and yeah. And you see this. You see this. You see this a lot of martial arts as well. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, my, center. and my sport is Aikido, so it's close to that. Mine too. Um, so um, back to what you said about Fernando Flores and all that. Like Bohm dialogue is exactly what you described, and that uh -huh. dates back yeah. to David Bohm and post wars and kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And also Quaker meeting is a lot like that. A Quaker meeting for worship and meeting for business mm -hmm. is, is an mm -hmm. awful lot like that. So yep. there's, a, there's a bunch of models that have existed for a while uh, about getting together and not being very analytic. And then also in You Just Don't Understand, uh, Deb Tannen talks about gender differences. And one of mm -hmm. my early earliest girlfriends basically made me aware that I don't actually need you to troubleshoot and su offer suggestions to fix this thing I'm talking about. I actually just need you to listen. And hear me and i'm like that, that, i couldn't it took me a while for that to internalize i was like wait what okay i, I, assume, I assume you've seen the masterful youtube about the headache the, the man and the woman I, and the I, headache i think so that's, I'll, uh, fi I'll find i'll find it and post it up please that sounds great uh okay. and let's make our way through the through the queue i had doug judy john Okay, uh, last weekend I had an amazing experience which kind of builds on this slow theme. We had basically a hundred graduate students in economics together for three days in Zoom. 
And the story for me is how amazingly effective it was when you took the time to let everybody in the group, all the little postage stamps around the screen, uh, ask their questions and keep going. So like here, I might want to ask Gil a question. And then the way I do that would lead him to want to ask me back a question. And everybody's patiently enjoying that conversation because they know that the time will come when they can be in that. And what was striking was to feel the whole group slowly move into a deeper appreciation of what the framework was that was being discussed, which was basically about the way money flows in society. And it turns out that is a great uh, framework for understanding economy, much better than the formal systems that are normally used. So you watch this group whose careers are based on learning formalism, slowly accommodate to this discussion and with some relief and appreciation. And it was amazing. And it just, it took time. It was three days. Uh, and these people, very few Americans all over the world. And what was striking was just watching people from uh, Kenya or South Africa or Estonia uh, coming into the same conversation slowly together with a shared appreciation. And it really heightened my sense of what can be done online because it was Zoom, it was all in Zoom. And you have simple things like if somebody gets up to go to the bathroom in a face-to-face -face group, it's disruptive. Here, it's just a little blip uh, and the group maintains its coherence across time. Mm -hmm. It was really a striking experience to me. Very, it was, uh, I hate the word transformational because it's so corny, but it, 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 you did get a sense that, that people came out of it with a deep shared appreciation of the conversation. Uh, two quick things before I turn it over to Matt. Matt um, do you know if anybody logged or described this process and put it online any place? Because that would be really, really useful for us to just absorb and, and borrow from. <clears throat> and then the second thing is, are you familiar with sand key diagrams? Uh, this economist named Sankey back in Britain basically used water to illustrate uh, the flows in the economy. And uh, it's really, it's really, really interesting. I put a link in, in the Mattermost uh, to Sankey diagrams because it's just a way of visualizing the flows of, of money in that case, but you could visualize a whole bunch of different things. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, uh, you're muted. I was gonna ask Doug as well, um, if, uh, you know, who facilitated that process, I'd like to, I'd like to talk to that person. Um, and maybe it's just that the rules facilitated the process. Um, so um, more curious there, but I think part of um, what's interesting to me, and we've talked about this a couple of times on this call is moving this call from being something that happens on Thursday for a period of time, that's something that is happening in perpetuity and people come and they go and as long as we sort of know what those rules are, people can come and go as they see fit um, and you know, sort of join and ask questions and then we just keep doing it. And I think one of the things that I'd like to, um, I'm thinking about uh, doing, I, I'm close in March is just inviting one of our graphic facilitators just to be taking visual notes of these conversations as well um, and see, see what that does to, to help us keep this perpetual conversation going. Because I think in that way, Doug, you talked about how interesting frameworks and concepts and things started to reveal themselves emerge out of a long period of time. And I think time is one of the things that we've really undervalue in today's society. We've given it up. And I'm not, I, I think we've said time is so much, time is money. And so everything has to be less time. Um, and my biggest struggle with a lot of our clients is what used to be three day workshops are now, you know, 90 minutes. And they say, well, in 90 minutes, I want to get our strategy for our business. And I want to, you know, align and mobilize everybody against these concepts. And, um, and I say, well, here's how far you can get, but, but you, you can't because of the viral, and it's not viral, it's something else, right? It's this complex contagions of sense making together that, that create real change, um, yeah, so I appreciate the fact that you guys were able to spend three days in that environment and I'd love to participate. Um, 
with this group in, in those kind of models? Um, On facilitation, the, the it was mostly actually architectural. Yeah. That is the morning and the afternoon started with three presentations that were all of 10 minutes long. Yep. That just set the frame. And then to have an hour and a half of open conversation. Uh, and that model didn't really require people to facilitate it. It's just people self-organized around the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then on, on the topic of having long-term conversations, as Matt was describing, two, two quick things. One is Joey Ito used to have an IRC channel uh, that was always open, and he was doing business on the IRC channel in public view. It was really fascinating. And he also had a bot on the channel called the Joey Bot. And you could, if you knew enough to run the commands, you could query the Joey Bot uh, about the people who were there or have the Joey Bot do different tasks or a bunch of different things like that. And then separately, Last night, no, two nights ago, um, I basically stepped into Vincent, uh, so invited me into a clubhouse uh, conversation that uh, I was in the last of five hours that he and Charles Blass had been running. And uh, like the night before or two days earlier, Charles had hosted a, a clubhouse call or club room or whatever they're called that ran six hours. And I'm like, I don't know how you did, how you do that. It's exhausting. Um, but they were in there and, and, and it was really pretty cool. And Vincent and I have talked a little bit since about how it's an evanescent conversation, but you get rapid intimacy because you have high quality voice, which does that. You can read so much from people's tone uh, and, you know, and, and all of that. And, uh, and yet, and yet me and, and my brain for all these years, it's incredibly frustrating for me to be in any, in any meaningful and interesting conversation and not be able to say, oh, go here, look here, you know, here's some resources and here's, a, uh, here's some stuff that might be useful to you. So I had, I had this multi-emotionally multi layered kind of uh, experience of the, the clubhouse conversation. Vincent, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, so I'm like simultaneously frustrated because Clubhouse is like all in the moment and a lot of people are complaining about it, it like being such a big time sink because it's like people have FOMO. And so if there's three rooms going on with three really interesting talks, you kind of, it's like being at a conference where like you wanna like be at like different sessions that are going on and you can't. So you, you pick one and you can never get that time back. Like it's like, you, you're never gonna get to go back to that event. So it's that kind of feeling, but online where you basically feel like you have to be in the room because if you miss something really, you could miss a really interesting nugget that will just be then lost in the void for eternity if you weren't there. Um, and so- Now I feel worse. <laughs> yeah, but at, at the same time though, there's a different level of conversation that comes from being vulnerable with complete strangers with no video, just hearing one person talk at a time, hearing their voice, and knowing that you're not recorded and you can kind of say exactly what you, you think you should say at that moment. So it's, it kind of goes both ways. Um, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I'm a huge fan. If anyone wants an invite, send me a message in Mattermost. I already sent some, Matt, I got you. Cool. Um, yeah, just send me your number so I could uh, text it to you. And then, um, yeah, actually I'll be hosting a room at one talking about like, micro economies and like parallel economic systems um, with Jubilee from game B. Um, so that's we're hoping it won't go too long, but it might. And it might be interesting to host, to have uh, a Mattermost channel running in parallel with a clubhouse room. I don't know. I mean, does that break clubhouse's rules or dynamics? Because if you could be talking and sharing uh, and there's just no video, that seems to me to be like a great leap forward. So um, during a last talk that we did on Tuesday, it was basically like people sharing their startups, um, social entrepreneurs, and then talking about what they needed help with. Um, and so we had a Google Doc that was going in parallel to the room where people could kind of add notes and resources. People were like, oh, you should check out this like fellowship or this thing. And so people could kind of like add. So we had like, I was scribing and then people, we also made it like an editable doc but yeah, I would love to kind of have like some parallel um, tech tools to be able to augment the experience 
the, the main barrier to that is a lot of people actually like Clubhouse because they can listen into these really intimate conversations while they're doing the dishes, while they're right. driving in the little like hour of, of a day that you would put on music or when you're multitasking or put on a podcast, people are going to Clubhouse. Did, so the, some, did the Google group, did the Google Doc enhance or in, in, inhibit the conversation? Did it, how, how did it affect the, that conversation? Um, I'll probably be able to report better on that next week because we set up the doc like in the middle of it, kind yeah. of. And so it was a little rough. Um, and also Clubhouse doesn't let you, like they don't have URLs in the bio. So like people have to like type in something. So we're going to have like for the room, a URL, like a short link that people can go to. And I think once we do that, we'll get a better handle on how many people want to actually contribute to something outside of just audio during in, in a clubhouse room. Um, awesome, thank you. Uh, Scott, briefly, and then I wanna go back to the queue and we're not gonna get through everybody because we're 15 minutes from the end of our time. This is a very, <clears throat> very quick comment. Um, I had mentioned my interest in being more synchronous, less asynchronous. I consider this synchronous time because we are all doing the same thing at the same time, even though we're not in the same place. And it just occurred to me that Clubhouse via pod, like in comparison to a podcast, same thing, conversation going on, conversation going on, listen to it when you want, but it's happening right now. And we're all experiencing the same time. And I think that's, that might be what makes it so powerful. It's like the Snapchat for voice, for conversations or, or something. I don't know. We never watch TV together anymore. That's we right. never sit in the salons and listen to music together yeah. anymore. We never, you know, like I not that was a little bit too strong. It's not that we never, but as a society, we've lost those things. So yeah, yeah. I've been spending a lot of time there, and I think the constraint of the medium is brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's go, Judy, John, Julian. I'm just finding myself torn between conflicting nonprofit organizations and the amount of energy that is being taken by each of them so that I'm on five or six hours of Zoom calls per day, plus trying to do offline work to generate content to go into those calls. So as intriguing as the idea of a continuous call would be, I, it's totally overwhelming in terms of my energy availability if I'm going to get effective work done in these other arenas. So I kind of like this hour and a half, it's usually uplifting. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Agreed. And in some sense, our metamost uh, chats and the OGM list are continuous. I mean, we can post there whenever, but we can catch up on our own time. And well, yeah, I, the idea I like the discourse organization by topic too, because I'm more interested in keeping up with some topics than other topics. Yeah. So I think we're just in kind of the growth stage of exploring a lot of different available tools and what's going to work best for the different kinds of things that we all want to do. Um, and hopefully, we can keep the craziness of the general ward at bay with awareness, you know, mm -hmm. and with careful intervention with those we can influence. Mm -hmm. Love that. Uh, thanks, Judy. Anything else you want to check in on? No. Okay. Uh, John, Julian, George. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to reflect on a couple of threads. There's so much rich material here that's been mentioned. Um, quickly, uh, Gil talked about you know, just the over several people have talked about the overwhelm, but in particular, he talked about you know how, how do you possibly keep track of all these things? And there was a period in my work when uh, we we're doing pretty intense consulting with teams and with multiple teams, but the same people on the teams, but in different roles. And it got it was so intense that we saw each other. So we were able to say, okay you are going to watch for this thing. You know, you are in charge of B2B internet, you know, and you tell us what the developments are in that space. You are going to watch this other thing. Now, when we do a check-in like this at, at our lunch meeting, we would say, okay, check-in. You, you can say a personal thing, but you also report on your portfolio. You report on the particular thing that you're supposed to be watching. And if you haven't been watching it, you say, well, you know, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I got I got on this other thing and I, I'll report next time. On, it was an impeachment on, trial. I couldn't help it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Something like that. Um, second thought, I, 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 love, I really like uh, Doug's story about the economists. Um, and I'm very encouraged because normally 
my experience with economists and Doug's experience with economists, is, it's hard. It's very hard to uh, bring this group along. And just two thoughts. You don't have to respond now, Doug, or at all if, if you don't want to. But I think some keys there were the the, ten, the, the the alternation between the TED effect and the open unlimited effect. In other words, 10 minute conversations for the kickoff, one, two, three, and then now we go to open space. So that, that orchestrated alternation between a time constraint and focus, that's one important thing. But the other important thing, even though this was global, I think there's, you, you need, you need I don't know what to call it exactly. It's not a fig leaf. It, maybe it's a grass skirt. You need something that that connects the people. I mean, we, we here, we have like, we're wearing three or four grass skirts in the sense that there's there's so many things that we collective individually check into and then we can see that the other people here have checked into those things. So, you know, we're like tied together in multiple ways. But I think the fact that this group was all economists gave them permission to be less economists in the traditional uh, sense. Uh, you know, I mean, other factors, of course, multiple factors, international, youth, worlds coming apart, you know, I mean, many, many factors going on there. But um, I think economists had had uh, something to do with it. The other quick observation, I've tried to watch Fox News. <laughs> I've forced myself to watch, you know, a little more than five minutes. But I find it, well, I get drawn into these situations. Some of them are on Clubhouse, you know. Some of them are not, but if you're in a room with a really articulate, really empowered libertarian, it's different. <laughs> you know, it's different than, than this meeting here. I mean, some of us have an understanding of that mindset and some of us, you know, agree with parts of that mindset. Sure. Uh, you know, turning poor people into, into entrepreneurs, small entrepreneurs. Sure. Sure. Good thing. Uh, you know, there, I mean, there's a bunch of things that we wouldn't say no to, but we might question the universality of some of the pronouncements. Like, if government does it, it's not going to work. It's going to be wrong. If corporate, if big corporations do it, it's probably going to be wrong. Yeah, that's, we don't want big. We don't want big corporate. Nah. We don't want government. Nah. We want people who want to get really rich. They're really smart, and they're really like you know the top 0.01 percent. Oh, what about those other folks? Well, you know, you got to play. Your thing failed. There's lots of cash sloshing around. So just get, stay on the merry-go-round and come, it'll come around again and you get on the merry-go-round, you know, and <laughs> it's a worldview. It, it, it's, I think, I think a lot of you have encountered this worldview and you go, wow, you know, wow. I guess if you lived in that world, you could think that that would work for a, mo for a lot of the population and that we wouldn't be going down the tubes as a planet <laughs> doing that. But if, if you're open to it, you realize, you know, those entrepreneurial venture funded things are just, if not more susceptible to the things you don't like about the institutions that you've decided already don't work. Just mentioning that as, as a kind of a dialogue I'm participating in. And, um, you know, that's enough. <laughs> that's enough, I think. All right. Thank you. Well, John, I think you're, I, I think you're right in that um, structure wins. And as we begin to participate in these structures to change them, um, yeah. they begin to change, they begin to change us. Um, and unless you're really, really disciplined, um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of um, startups and entrepreneurs who set out to change the world, but the minute that they start getting the big contracts with the big companies and all that kind of stuff, then they're in the business of being in business and then they become part of the economies. And, you know, so I think that there's some really fundamental things that have, there has to be this third space for people to, to create where they don't have to participate in that, that those structures to create, right? Sure. And just a quick personal note. I, I really appreciate Kevin's uh, inputs on these talks because I would see him as someone who I don't I don't really know the background but completely, but see him as someone who's transcended through, past, and out of that entirely meritocratic entrepreneurial thing and said, "Hey, well, okay, okay, okay. I'm I'm going to use parts of this 
but I'm going to make it work for more people. Yes. I really I'm like waiting, that. I really appreciate it. I'm waiting for Kevin to write his, bio, his autobiography. So <laughs> I want to see the memoirs. Okay. Um, let's go uh, Julian, George, Vincent, Klaus, but I'd love to wrap near the half hour. So we won't make it through everybody uh, on that list. One nice thing about going later, and it will be quick. I have a bunch of quick singers to people who came before me, because uh, unlike Hank, in the past week I haven't gotten much time to think because I've spent so much time in meetings. Um, and Matt, I wanted to mention that you're up to 13 now. I'm not watching the trial either. Uh, I don't consider it a good use of my time because I pretty much gave up on the U.S. a couple of years ago when they indicated that they were okay with children dying in concentration camps. And I'm very deliberately using the term concentration camp. Uh, given my upbringing, I was, as a kid, I was frequently introduced to people with numbers tattooed down their arms. And you know, this is where I disagree with uh, the previous outlier in the call, which is that long-term thinking, yeah, that's critical, but you've got to stop the monster as soon as you can. Uh, so getting back to rechecking in right now, my technical life is tied up with fighting with csharp.net and the Neo4j interface, uh, which is critical. It's, it'll let me finish uh, step two of my three-step plan to world domination. Excellent. And on an unrelated note, I was going to throw in in terms of entrepreneurship and capitalism and libertarianism, I recently heard an interesting story about how Howard Hughes killed Hiller aircraft to the detriment of the USA. And I don't have a link for that because it was an oral presentation, but I can dig up some more information if anybody would like. How he killed Hiller aircraft? Yes. Oh, not a story I know. Interesting. Uh, so uh, Hiller, Hiller a, with an H. Yeah. Hiller, yeah, H-I-L-L-E-R. Right. Yeah. And if you're um, familiar with the Bay Area, then that's the same Hiller as in the Hiller Aircraft Museum. Hiller Aviation in, in, the, in the museum. Yeah, cool. I, we will look that up. Um, thanks, Julian. Let's go George Vincent Klaus. Hi. Um, I have a question. How many of you are using Rome, R-O-A-M? Good question. Anybody? Nobody here is using Rome? Doug what, is. What, what is it? Rome, it's it, romeresearch.com. It is a thought processor, um, which I think is a tremendous improvement on the brain. I use the brain also, um, but it is a, basically a note-taking method, but it, it is ridiculously easy to create links and you get back links and forward links and it just brings together all of your thinking. And um, it has transformed my life and I'm absolutely convinced that everybody, every knowledge worker, every scholar, every thinker is going to be on it within a year or two. It is just, and it's getting the brain like um, interfaces with it because it's got, it's got an open API. So a lot of people are putting stuff in it so that all those links can get automatically diagrammed. So you can think visually, you can think in words. It, it has made me 20 IQ points higher, absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, and it, I just had the thought five minutes before I got on here that what, see, I've been using the brain last four or five months to dump in my present thinking. All my past thinking is in the brain and is in Devon Think. Um, and I'm bring, slowly bringing a lot of stuff from Devon Think into, into Rome. But it occurred to me, what if I put my current thinking, the last four months of my thinking in constructing my mind skills templates, um, which are mental methods that you can automatically plunk down and then fill in as an aid to your thinking. Um, what if I put all my work into GP th GPT-3 and asked it develop, to develop templates? And then you could retire. Yeah. So, so it will be a gigantic thinking tool. Does anybody, can anybody point me to how I can find out more about the most efficient way? I mean, obviously I can Google it, but is there an efficient way? Is anybody using GPT-3? No, huh? Nobody has, I think that, I think no, you have, Do you have an opinion? What's the matter with this group? You're all thinking for yourselves. 
We've, uh, we, in, in Free Jerry's Brain, uh, we've talked a little bit about using GPT-3 on something like Jerry's Brain. Um, I, don't, I don't think anybody's gotten around to it. Um, I, Rome is great, um, and uh, it's, it's awesome for some people, and it doesn't quite click for other people. There's, there's a, other tools called, there's one Obsidian. I use something called Stroll. Yeah. Um, the, there's a class of tools, Rome-like tools, uh, that kind of burst on the scene the yes. last year and, and have really energized the ability for people to keep track of things and add IQ points to their, you know, to their ability to manage information. And we've yeah, got... it doesn't have to be Rome. It, there are a lot of different schemes for doing that, but basically it's creating a second brain, of it, creating a, another brain in which you can see we can get it all in there and then see connections that you wouldn't ordinarily see. Stuff comes up that I didn't know I had in there and that I didn't know was connected. Right. We've got uh, Scott and Julian with comments. And I think what Scott's about to say is one of the things I wanted to add, which is the latest version of the brain uh, has Rome features in the notes field. Like, like Harlan saw what was coming and baked it in. It's not quite parallel functionality to Rome. And I don't know the difference. And I haven't, I haven't walked that path myself. So Scott and Jerry knows I have a, a, I have a YouTube video of how to run Rome inside the brain, right? Which is so funny. No you can't believe yeah. it. Yeah. The, my experience with, with Harlan has been that he is, that's his area where he's actively developing. And the neat thing is he already had the brain built. So all he has to do is build the notes. They built it up right. from the ground up. It looks just like the Rome in, in line unmentioned links, suggested links, backlinks, it's all in there. And that's just their first version of it. So they're yeah. going to surpass where I think Rome is never going to be able to get to the brain, what the brain has built in their visual interface. So I think the brain V12 has got it all right now. Interesting. So I was going to mention, uh, I was going to mention that for people working in knowledge science, this whole idea of backward links uh, has been commonplace in the knowledge field for 25 years. Uh, sure. if, if you work with RDF or semantic graphs um, in triple stores, right, that's been well known. When I went back to NASA in 2002 to work on the shuttle program, it was already a matter of picking which technology to use. So th there's a, a big litany of, of having the power to do that. It's somewhat more usable now that personal computers are much more powerful. But then uh, because it's one of my favorite topics, I'm going to link this into using uh, graph databases versus relational databases. So. Cool. And we've just uh, crossed the half hour mark. I'd love to just keep our calls to 90 minutes, despite uh, uh, everything else, just because we're in lots and lots of Zoom. And, and we, I, I could do this all day, actually, just because of you all, because uh, I, uh, I love sort of ransacking our mutual consciousness in this friendly way, it's uh, it's really great. So, so with that, let me just say thank you for this call and uh, take us out and see you on the on the inner tubes in in the clubhouses and the mattermosts and the discourses and the emails and the oh my god everywheres. But uh, but thank you. Exactly. What about FOMO? <laughs> yeah, and FOMO. I got FOMO now.